Today, I'm joined by the brilliant Susanna Fogel to talk about her new feature, Cat Person. I also welcome critic Ellen E. Jones to give her perspective on the riveting film that was inspired by the viral New Yorker short story. Here's Susanna on the central character, Margot. Margot is trying to figure out what movie she's in. Like the movie of her life, you know, if we're like walking through our life and we're like, is my life a tragic story? Is it a comedy? Is it you meet someone and you're like, oh my God, it, can I put myself into this romantic comedy that I want to be in? Is this the guy? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to Girls on Film. I'm your host, Anna Smith. Today I'm reunited with one of my favourite filmmakers, Susanna Fogel, who co-wrote Book Smart in her I Spoke To recently for A Small Light. We're now talking about her new feature called Cat Person. Cat Person is inspired by Kristen Rapenian's viral New Yorker short story of the same name. It focuses on a young, single and seemingly self-possessed woman, played by Amelia Jones, who's best known for her lead role in the Oscar-winning Coda. Cat Person, directed by Susanna, is a very different film. Emilia's character Margot meets the older Robert, played by Succession's Nicholas Braun. And as well as being gripping, the film explores their relationship and brings up many issues around dating and consent. Is that that guy Robert again? Listen, concession stand girl. Why don't you give me your number? Wait, you never said where he goes to school. I think he just works. Oysters, come on. He has cats. His eyes are nice. They crinkle. Yeah, because he's old. I think I really like him. Well, Susanna, welcome back to Girls on Film. Thank you. It's so good to have you on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking to you last time. Thank you. Yeah, me too. And I did promise that we would return and talk about Cat Person. So yeah, here we are. I know. I'm so excited. For the listeners, I mean, maybe we'll start with the title. Um, that's an interesting place to start in terms of explaining what the film is and also maybe the tone of the film, because I felt like when I first saw it, I thought, ooh, is it actually about cats? Is it cat people? You know, one of those thrillers. Uh, yeah, tell us more. Yeah, so it's based on a short story that was in The New Yorker in 2017. That short story was called Cat Person, so I can't take credit for the title in any yeah. way. The titles are referenced to the fact that this younger woman, Margot, who dates this older man, Robert, is is trying to figure out um, who he is, if if he can be trusted. And at one point he said he had two cats. And so she felt like that was a signifier that he was a good guy and a sweet nurturing guy and a gentle guy. And then she never sees the cats, which confuses her among other things as she tries to figure out if he's a threat or, or someone safe to proceed down the road with. Were his cats at least cute? I never saw them. Uh-oh. Why lie about having cats? Because liking cats makes a guy seem non-threatening. Harmless. He's hiding something. And obviously the article went viral, everyone was talking about it. What did you see in this story that made you um, and your colleagues feel that it was cinematic? Well, when I first read the story, to be honest, I didn't think it was. I thought it was a perfect short story and I said, oh no, somebody's going to ruin this with an adaptation. That's going to be... <laughs> too small and too internal and it's going to have bad voiceover and it's just going to be a tiny movie that only women see and men don't see themselves in and it's not going to have the same it's not going to have the same reach um, whereas the story kind of thrust those themes in front of an audience of New Yorker readers who are like men older men everybody you know people that wouldn't see a female driven movie right. necessarily would, and I think that's why it was so explosive because it was forcing them to reckon with some things but but yeah, I mean, I didn't see the adaptation when I when I read the story. I didn't know what it would be. And then a couple of years later, I read the script that Michelle Ashford had written. And I thought she did a brilliant job of taking all of the fears and fantasies that were in Margot's head described so well by Kristen and and made them manifest in these these scenes where as a viewer, you're actually plunged into the subjective experience that Margot's having. Yeah 
where like there's these intrusive thoughts that are just hijacking your everyday activities. And I think that's very relatable for women because we're always on some level aware that we're in danger. Extremely relatable. And I think it's interesting what you said about a movie that men watch because I think this is a great film to recommend to anybody and in yeah. particular perhaps couples who can have an interesting conversation afterwards. I mean, what was your goal in terms of the getting the tone and the balance right that would attract a wide range of people? Because I feel this is actually a very accessible film. It's Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's just, there are decisions we made that you can never predict what's going to hit the culture and how, but to me, being aware of what is going to alienate male audiences and trying to avoid that is something that, to the extent that it doesn't affect the creative negatively, is, is, is an important thing to consider because I do want the movie to be accessible and I want men to buy into what they're watching so that they can see themselves in Robert or Margot or see their own lives in the encounters that the movie's about. Um, so to me, it, start, it started with decisions like casting Nick so Nick is like a likable guy on Succession. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that men are like, ah, six, oh, I love that guy. Ah, yeah. Cousin Greg, I love exactly. him. So then Cousin Greg can show up and play a totally different role and be really problematic and kind of a little, have some light in self qualities. And you can push him to do some really extreme things, but you start with this base level of accessibility for a male audience. So I liked that he was a guy's guy in that way. Mm -hmm. I think what you're always up against when you show men doing things that are arguably problematic is that men will defend themselves by distancing themselves from the character. They'll say, well, that's not me. I don't behave like that. And this is a story where there's more, um, hopefully more sympathy for Robert. So you're kind of understanding why he's led down this path of thinking what he thinks. You understand why he feels confused yeah. about how to be a man in the world, confused about what she wants because she's confused about she, what she wants. You, you kind of understand where he's coming from, even if the way he reacts is really, can, can, be, can be toxic. Even the word toxic, it's like, it, we almost overuse words like that as a simplification of a complex idea. Yeah. And so hopefully we try to complicate the idea for people enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, my hope is that, my hope is that like, men, and my hope is that men see the movie and they see that it's a bit of a mirror for everybody. Yeah. and how we interact. Yeah. yeah. I thought you used some very interesting devices um, when Margot is kind of appearing to herself and questioning herself about, you know, let's have a conversation almost. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you talk to me more about that decision? It's really interesting. Yeah, that was in Michelle's script. So I, mm -hmm. Michelle gets the credit for that. But um, Michelle and I are both real scholars of psychology. Um, mm -hmm. She's really interested in, in Carl Jung. And we just talked a lot about and, and Freud, we just talk about trauma a lot. And like, we talk, we talk about it in its most extreme form. It's like you, people talk about like leaving their body, like they don't want to be present. So they like drift above and they watch themselves having this experience of being abused in abuse cases. But I also think it's something that women do when we get ourselves into a situation that we like didn't really want to be in. We're not literally floating above, but we can all relate to sort of seeing ourselves from that bird's eye view and being like, how did I become this woman in this story? How yeah. did I become this? How did I get into this relationship where I'm having this fight with somebody? This is, I'm above this. Or you just kind of judge yourself. So so we wanted that. And we also wanted to show that she is like as far as she can possibly be from her own body in an experience where she's supposed to be like totally in her body and connecting to her partner. They're totally disconnected and she's like left her body <laughs> in a bad way, you know? It was so interesting because it, it strikes me, it's, it's so rare to see explored in screen in that way. And I do hope that consent is being explored more in cinema in a way which tackles that gray area and, and those yeah. micro decisions that both parties are making throughout this whole messy, often messy and complicated experience. Yeah, I think it's like the consent thing is so interesting because I think it's become really oversimplified in the way we talk about it. Like we're so fixated on the legality of it and the notion that there's like, the woman is the keeper of the one word answer that is the permission, mm -hmm. you know, that like, if the woman says yes, that's kind of the most important headline about the experience because she said yes, the one moment. And I think for most women, they're like, well, I know what it feels like to change your mind. I know what it feels like to feel ambivalent. I know what it feels like to be 20 years old and totally confused about what you want. And yet we're sort of given the gatekeeper role with that idea of consent. And 
it's a it's a huge burden actually in a way. So I think wanting to show a situation where the experience of sex is not positive, but it's not assault, and where we see Margot consenting often. You know, he does ask. He d- he does try to do the thing mm, in his that's way. That's right. Yeah. And she keeps saying, "Yes, yes, I want to go to your she let's go to your house and is this okay?" And she says, "Yes." And it's it's like she is agreeing. She's just ambivalent about moment to moment what she wants it to be. It's so much more nuanced than Yes, definitively, I, a 20-year-old, know what I want, and that is, like, permanent. Because our minds are complicated, and psychology is complicated, and what you, as yes. you show in the film, what you consented to five minutes ago maybe not what you're really wanting to do now. Yeah. It's interesting because I've actually spoken to gay men who've said they identify with that kind of experience of a grey area of consent, and kind of like, oh, I better get this over with. I'm not really enjoying it anymore. Yeah. But, you know, and putting yourself in that position... It's, it's really sad, isn't it? That's... Yeah, it's like, I think it just bespeaks a disconnect that a lot of us feel when we have sex with people. You know, it's mm. not the experience that it's rarely as connected as, you know, it's supposed to be. And obviously, I think there are different things in our culture that make that worse. But I'm sure that women long before social media were feeling like they had to placate men or that they like made a promise they had to keep or something like those are age old issues between us they Um, certainly are yeah so that's really complicated too but but yeah I mean I think hopefully another thing that men will see is that you know when they're watching the scenes between them Robert is in his own head like they're both performing a thing she's performing like confident empowered woman with agency and he's performing like stud (laughs) in his mind which is like a a, a performance that's like yeah. the amalgamation of all the porn he's watched, you know, because he hasn't had that much experience with actual women. So it's like he's doing a whole thing. He's in his head about how she's perceiving that. I got to do this impressive thing. I got to be good at mm-hmm. sex. And despite the asking and answering that's happening consent-wise, like the camera can just look at her face, which he's not even really registering. And her face is like telling the opposite story. Yeah. So like you get the clues about how nuanced it is. And you also see him not phys- like physically not looking at her face when her face is like showing the the truth, you know. Yeah, it's kind so of you're seeing him missing all the cues, and you're also understanding and hopefully empathizing with the fact that he like he missed the cues, so he's confused when yeah. she blows him off because he he was reading it wrong because he wasn't looking in the right place, you know. Um, I'll do a large popcorn and red vines. It's an unusual choice. Thank you. I don't think I've actually ever seen someone buy red vines. Okay. I guess you're wondering why we sell them then, if nobody buys them. Amelia Jones is so great in this. Um, we've had her on Girls on Film before. She's such a terrific actress. I'd She's love to amazing. know yeah. how she came to the project and also how you prepared with both these actors what are some very, very complex scenes. Amelia, it, I mean, I saw Coda right out of Sundance before it came out. And it was my, she had actually auditioned for a TV show that I directed years and years ago, but she was 15. So she was like too young to be cast in that. And I, rem- and I remembered later that she was the girl from that audition who was always good. But when I watched Coda, I just um, just like offered her the part. <laughs> I just knew she could Brilliant. do it, you know? Yeah. Um, she's so relatable and she's actually such a character actress. She doesn't like look the part of what you'd assume is a character actress because they usually don't look like ingenues, but she does and is a character actress. Like she's deeply committed to inhabiting a role. Right. Um, and it's not like she just showed up and played herself and herself as Margot. She actually made incredibly specific choices. And, and then I worked with her on another film where she played a completely opposite role and she was incredible in that too. And I'm like, wow, this girl's like got incredible range, but she has the ability to seem like a normal girl somehow, somehow she can cosplay as like normal girl on campus, (laughs) even though she's like a beautiful actress. And I think I wanted somebody who was the age of the character so that it wasn't a person who just registers as adult. But anyway, she was just perfect for it. I knew she could handle the humor. Yeah. She also has like a, just an innate 
she's soulful, like she has gravitas, mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, that's necessary because Margot's going to do some really naive stuff that like teenagers do, and adults. But you know, Margot can be pretty immature in moments, and yet if it's coming from Amelia, you're sort of identi- you're, you stay with her on the journey, even yeah. if you're like a smart woman who is empowered. It's not like you're watching just a naive woman going through the world and saying like, oh yeah, here's another victim in a story about women being victims, you know? Absolutely not. I felt that I, I massively related to her, despite being, you know, twice her age. You know, watching this, I, I, I was with her yeah. all the way, you know? And it was so effective. In terms of the film doing things differently, um, was there anything else you wanted to talk about in terms of what you made a very clear decision with the team that you were going to approach differently with this film or any cliches that you wanted to swerve that one might often see in this sort of territory I mean I didn't want to show any nudity from Amelia because I didn't Mm. want it to like have any overlap on the Venn diagram with anything that men could be titillated by so I was like don't show any don't give them anything to look at that's like going to make this fun for them to look at and kept us in her experience more too I felt really strongly about the music choices Mm, tell me more that's a thing that I wanted the aesthetics of the of the music to really be speaking to like the generations upon generations upon generations of cultural references that we have for like love in particular that men latch onto. So looking at like, in terms of, if that music is like Robert's playlist, because Robert believes that they don't make, Robert's a like, they don't make movies like they used to guy. (laughs) They don't make music like they used to. They don't make movies like they used to, like has this nostalgic fixation on a simpler time when Ultimately, women were way more muzzled than they are now. But to him, it's like those are the narratives that like end well for the guy. So like, I think Robert has that sort of that sort of melancholy that a lot of men have, that nostalgia for like mm-hmm. something that makes more sense to them, where it's not so complicated by all these new yeah. terms and rules and boundaries. So for Robert, that means you know it's a combination of like classic, mostly male singers who are singing about love in ways that don't really age well if you look at the lyrics to oh, those yeah. songs you know <laughs> like and, and, but yeah. the truth is that like it's it's some of my favorite music too I'm not like boycotting the Beach Boys even though they sing about 15 year old girls on the beach you know it's not that I think women should be like under men's thumb even though I like the song under my thumb you know I'm yes, not like actually. well I agree with this song <laughs> but I listen to it yeah I dance to it yeah but also what why am I dancing to that yeah so that's complicated I wanted all of that to just be in the ether of the movie and like the Beach Boys singing about like in my room and dreaming and pr- it's all about projecting those those relationships that those men are, they're not having functional love affairs with 15 year old hot California girls, you know, they're yeah. like not doing that. But if they did do it, it would be like Robert and Margot. So it's like a little bit that. So I just, I felt really strongly that that, that was the music, that, that that had to be the music of the movie. Cause mm-hmm. it's sort of, it's it's great music. And it doesn't fall into the trap of like female director making female director making movie about young women with like tons of female vocalists in it for for women. You know, like that's not what this is. But I also feel like if you're a female director, you also get the pressure, the weight of having to like change the culture and change the the statistics sort of falls really heavily on you. So yeah, we'd have conversations where people would say, Can you just don't you think it would be more feminist to have more female vocalists? And I'm like, I think it would be feminist to let the female director decide what music she wants, you, you know? <laughs> but also, I understand where they're coming from. I mm-hmm. understand that there's, yeah. they want, but I think women are still the one, women and people of color are definitely the ones that get more pressure to hire women and people of color. Like, they're like, don't you want a diverse crew? Look at you, you're diverse, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, well, actually, let me, let me make my decisions the way that you would let a man make his, you know? Yeah. So there's like subtle stuff around it too, but um, yeah, the music was definitely a big piece of it for me. And The number of men, even peripherally, like, in my world that were, like, mansplaining mansplaining better music choices to me in my own movie was, the irony was not lost on me. (laughs) I got a lot of playlists. But don't you think that, don't you, but don't you really mean, I'm like, no, I I got it. I got it. Do you think there was a moment of self-awareness where they realized what they were doing? 100% no. (laughs) Definitely not. No way. Oh, that's too funny. No way. I know. It is funny. <laughs> funny, sad. Yeah, funny, tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sure that you put them in their place. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, it, but it's just the thing that's like, it's so like instinctive for people yeah. to, these in, these types of encounters are not like people trying to be problematic no, or anything. No, absolutely not. That's, that's the thing, isn't it? And I think this film, in encouraging the empathy for both characters up to a point, 
Yeah. Hopefully is helpful on that front. I think so. It's interesting. It's it's it doesn't fit neatly into like a consent narrative or a revenge narrative or a victim narrative. And I think that's a good thing because it just I think there's a certain amount of like, oh yeah, yeah, I know what this is that people have about most movies and most content. I hate using the word content, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Most things you turn something on and you kind of like, yeah, yeah, I know where this is going. It's like harder when when something's harder to define. It gets under your skin, and that's what we wanted with this. It is a very memorable film. It, before we wrap, I'd love to ask a little bit more about that tone and that ambiguity, because yeah. much like Margot's life, we don't necessarily know what direction this story is going to take, even if we've read the, the, the story in The New Yorker, and I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, it's one thing I l- talked about with Michelle, that, that then when I got to know Kristen, the writer of the story, I realized that she also really felt with her story, was that, like, Margot is trying to figure out what movie she's in. Mm. Like, the movie of her life, you know? If we're, like, yeah. walking through our life and we're like, is my life a tragic story? Is it a comedy? Is it, you meet someone and you're like, oh, my God, it, can I put myself into this romantic comedy that I want to be in? Is this the guy? Or is this the guy that kills me? Because I've seen that movie, too, you know? So I think the idea that Margot's, like, going through her life trying to figure out how to interpret something and, like, how to metabolize it as a person who's seen a, a ton of movies where women are treated well and horribly, they, they've played Scream at her theater. You know, they've played movies where women are just like final girls. She's seen all those images too. So she has those fears and those like that, the hypervigilance as women do. Um, but also like she's read love stories. And so she's like trying to figure out what, what's what. She wants something to fit into a story so that she can know how to act. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And she, like, is trying to jam it into a certain story for herself at different times. This has so much to say about how cinema influences us and yeah. the narrative we impose upon ourselves. Right. I love that. Yeah. Like, as if we didn't have enough to sort of fear, we have so much, like, visual... We have so many visual references for, like, ways that we could be mistreated. <laughs> and they're always, like, living in our brains as we go through the world, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's hard. It's like It's like you can have a fight or flight response to something, but it's like supported by a lot of imagery that we've, that's seared into our brains. And so when Margot has these like intrusive thoughts that hijack her mind, it's like, of course she does. She's been watching women be put in these positions for her whole life. Exactly. You know, the victim. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we did a special episode on Brainwash, the N- Nina Menkes film, oh, Brainwash. Yeah. I, I presume you've obviously aware yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that touches on some of the same very scenes that are tackled in your film. Yeah. For example, in Blade Runner. Yeah. And, it's, um, yeah. it's a lot. Like, it's, um, it's interesting. Like, I also think that the sort of, the question of where to go from here is one that I hope the movie asks as well, because... It's not a movie that's like, in conclusion, we should all stop trying and like the population will die out and no one should ever have sex or fall in love again in the end. You know, like it's not that. It's sort of a like, what now? What this, this went awry. Like, what are we gonna do about that? What's Margot gonna do? Is she gonna make the same mistake the same way? Probably not. But is she gonna never go out with another guy? Probably not. You know, it's just complicated. Yeah. What, what can she and we learn from what she's seen, you know? Well, I hope that people watch it and discuss it, which is... That's I all mean, I want. Yeah, that really does seem to be the case. <laughs> They'll take the conversation wherever they're going to because it's like a Rorschach test for their own it's shit. Like, but basically, I hope they talk about it. Yeah. Well, this is why we wanted to feature it. We want to get people <laughs> watching it and talking about it. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, I hope to get you back on Girls on Film with your next movie. I mean, yeah, my next movie has Amelia. So let's, let's go. Oh, let's t- do can it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I made a movie about this... American whistleblower named Reality Winner. Oh, that's right. Yes, there was a Sweeney that. film yeah. that focused on her interrogation and arrest. But we, I've made a coming of age film about her life. It's more like the Lady Bird version of the story about her and all the things that led to her, like doing what she did and becoming who she was. So she's like a, she's just like a blonde girl from Texas, grew up in a small town, was way too smart for her own good, taught herself Farsi in high school because she wanted to work for refugee camp, and then ended up you know, in the Air Force helping to conduct drone strikes and she was doing harm and not good. And so she had this crisis of faith. Long story short, she leaked a government document and she ended up um, like going to prison for many, many years. But, but basically she's like a spunky blonde Texan who likes guns and animals and CrossFit. <laughs> and Amelia played that and she like transformed her body, went on a protein diet that I think wreaked havoc on her um, 
like stomach lining forever. And but she played like a jockey bro. She's a amazing, blonde she? jockey bro who speaks like Arabic languages in this movie. So, I mean, that's what I mean. She just can do anything. She's so versatile. But yeah, that's our next movie. And we're hoping it comes out next year. We just, Thanks. we have to figure that out post-strike. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah, yes. yeah. Meantime, thank you again for talking cat person. Thank you so Lovely much to see for you. having me. That was director Susanna Fogel. My next guest is the film critic Ellen E. Jones, who I bumped into at London Film Festival, and we were talking loads about Cat Person. So what better thing to do than invite her onto the podcast to share her perspective? Here's Ellen. Ellen, welcome back to Girls on Film. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely delighted to have you here and to be talking about Cat Person. Mm. This is a film that I know that you and I have already sort of chatted about in a busy LFF closing night party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I sense it was too good in a conversation not to share with the listeners. So I would love to know, I mean, for those who haven't heard much about the film, could you broadly set it up for them? I mean, is it a relationships drama? It's so much more than that, really, isn't it? Yeah. So this is a film that began in 2017 with a short story also called Cat Person by Christian Rupenian. And that short story, which was about a a young woman's experience of a short relationship with an older man, went viral on the internet. Everyone was talking about it. You, you basically ha- were compelled to read it to know what was going on on Twitter and Instagram for a, at least a week. So that's now been ad- adapted into a movie. And it's, again, about a young woman's relationship with a slightly older man. But the question of what genre it's in, whether it counts as kind of a rom-com or a terrifying black horror story or a comedy, black comedy is is quite a moot one. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Along with so much in the film, it's inviting you, the viewer, to decide on that. You know, mm. it's, it, there's so many questions here. Are you rooting for this relationship to work? Are you terrified <laughs> something awful is going to happen? Possibly both. But you're certainly intrigued, much like uh, reading the short story, I think. It's a real mm. page turner of a movie. What I really found interesting here is, is when it's looking at the different perspectives of um, the the man and the woman in the relationship. Yes. And the, the opening quote from Margaret Atwood, I think is very telling. It says, mm. um, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Mm. Women are afraid that men will kill them. Mm. And, and how do you feel that that is then kind of weaved into the, the the subsequent story? Perfectly from the off, because that quote is kind of on lettering against a background of this sort of full moon, which instantly I'm thinking, on the, like the full moon has two kind of meanings in cinema. On the one hand, it's quite romantic. You know, a moonlit evening day is, is a sort of romantic ideal. And on the other hand, it's it's for me very much associated with werewolf movies. You know where you're where you're with a normal man one minute and then he turns into a sort of rapacious beast the next. <laughs> I love so. that. I hadn't thought about that <laughs> parallel. Yeah. Or I did it on purpose because I'm actually a werewolf. <laughs> Good idea for a series at the fourplex. Werewolf movies. And the filing cabinet scene from The Howling? That's about to happen right now. I just meant a door doesn't just shut or lock on its own. You sure you didn't close it? Can I? Yeah. I like a lot of women, I grew up as a young woman watching teen movies. Like the teen movies of the 80s and, and 90s would often be made by men and feature the young female character, like often high school age depicted in a very sort of sexualized way and I didn't have the words to describe how I felt about that then but as I got older I realized it's just very discomforting and uncomfortable to see yourself depicted through another person's eyes in that way and what I kind of love about Cat Person is it's sort of turning that around and it's a woman's a young woman's view on a slightly older man and in, in a way that I think is probably quite uncomfortable for a lot of them, will be quite uncomfortable for a lot of men to watch. And I'm, I sort of quite enjoy that, that reversal. Um, and I also think it's like, in terms of, you know, women's cinema in general, if there is such a thing, I think it's a sign that we're in good health because this is a film made by women about a woman's point of view. And although it's kind of about a relationship, well, it is about a relationship between a man and a woman, it's very much women talking to women in a way. There's a couple of key older female characters. They're in only for short scenes. You've got Hope Davis playing Margot, the, the, the lead 
a young woman's mother in a, in a very weird and fabulous set of scenes. And then Isabella Rossellini's playing her kind of older professor. So these, so that you're sort of these points of views on how young women are and and their own culpability in these just to put it mildly quite awkward dating situations is is all there in the film and I love that it's that it's talking it's women talking to women as well as being um sort of intergenerationally as well as as well as women talking to men yeah, it feels like the kind of territory that you sometimes see explored in more kind of foreign art house dramas mm. and then something which is actually sort of quite mainstream and accessible in many ways you know with mm. a sorry cast and it's yeah it's interesting to see that and I love the scenes you're talking about, you know, with the mother in particular. Uh, she's yeah. absolute, absolute hoot. If you're interested in psychology and gender, then this is a great film because, uh, you know, just every line the mother says so betrays why her daughter is the person that she is as well. Yes, yeah. I found that that scene fascinating because the advice she gives, and, and and maybe this speaks to my age as well, because, you know, I'm I'm no longer one of those young women that's, that's going on dates anymore. And part of this, I'm sort of experiencing this new way of, view, of viewing these films now this new kind of cinema experience where I'm having it quite a lot these days where as a sort of an, an older woman I'm watching these young women go on these terrible dates and sort of the excruciating torture of being like don't do that don't make that decision don't go out with him don't you know don't betray yourself in that way having that kind of dual perspective on it of, as having been the young woman and also now you know having children of my own they're not, not as old as Margot is in the film but that kind of thing and sort of sort of so understanding where the mum's coming from in a weird way even though her advice is it's quite realistic but also totally unhelpful quite practical but totally unhelpful you know for sort of how we navigate the, living in this world of patriarchy because she says something about compromise really doesn't she and that's yeah. that's basically her advice you know I wish I'd compromised more yeah um, you know and it just feels like oh yeah that does feel sort of, sort of defeatist but as yeah. you say realistic perhaps as well if you want to get along with a man and not be alone your whole entire life, make peace with a little discomfort. Although it has to be said that everything she says is then undermined by the next scene. <laughs> In which, um, just to affirm for anyone who has seen it, it is very weird to perform uh, Marilyn Monroe's sexy um, uh, song, My Heart Belongs to Daddy, in a duet with your own mother for your stepdad's 60th birthday party. If, if, if anyone ever suggests that, I want everyone to feel comfortable saying no. That is that is probably one of the most darkly comic scenes in the film <laughs> yeah. because this is a funny film, right, as well, isn't it? You know? It's very funny, yeah. Yeah, and it, another thing that um, made me laugh and that I very much related to was the obsession that he has with Harrison Ford and Harrison Ford's mm. films. And, of course, you know, Things we've pointed out on this very podcast, for example, in our Brainwash episode, you know, that various scenes in Harrison Ford films, much as I love them, where, mm. it, you know, his different characters really overstep the mark, to put it mildly. And there are serious consent issues, um, you know, in, in scenes in Blade Runner, as well as potentially some of the Star Wars films. And I love the way that they kind of play with that and kind of try to characterise him partly through that obsession and it makes a pretty yes. valid point would you yes. agree i like that it's a film reflecting on the ways in which film muddies the water and gives unrealistic expectations to both genders but i also i mean it's definitely a film for the film girlies you know because i think any of us who are women who like film and know about film will have had that experience of that kind of major red flag being a kind of man who was, will not accept that there might be a particular topic on which you know more or that you might have your own taste in films that isn't entirely revol revolving around Star Wars or whatever. <laughs> also addressed weirdly in the Barbie movie earlier this yes. year, I would say. It's, it's a recurring yeah. theme, the sort of mansplaining movies to women. Yeah, yeah. so I enjoyed that one a lot. Yeah, and then when, when she said uh, that she tried to sort of start a conversation with him about you know, films that she was interested in and mentioned that the only one she'd seen, that a film she'd seen that many times is Spirited Away and he just was not interested at all. <laughs> yeah, he just, he just dismissed it, didn't he? Yeah. What did you think about the, the casting for these two central characters? Casting's really interesting. So Nicholas Braun, who I think most people will probably know in their heads, if not out loud, as Cousin Greg. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Of course, that, that iconic character from Succession. Casting him as the romantic lead, that seems like a real misnomer, but I'm going to stick with it anyway. Casting him as a romantic lead in this is really interesting because his whole kind of star persona is this sort of bumbling, kind of harmless sort of oaf. In fact, he, he played in a, in a film that I would like favourably compare with this one, 
um, Zola, another film that's kind of adapted from a sort of internet phenomenon. He he was in that as well. Um, yeah, he's brilliant he's about, in that. Yeah, yeah. The, the sort of gap between um, the things you project onto people in text messages and social media communications and how they are in real life. But yeah, so it, I think that there's a real a really interesting warning to both men and women in his casting because the fact that he seems so harmless actually makes him more dangerous to women in a way because he's got this sort of what can happen is this sort of hyperinflated sense of entitlement to women's attention and you know their time and maybe even their bodies um which comes from this this feeling that this self image that he's a nice guy and you know he wouldn't do anything wrong to hurt women he just likes Harrison Ford films and so on so so if any woman's feeling in, intimidated by his company or has a boundary or whatever that's unnecessary you know that he's just a nice guy and that if, if women don't like him back then that's them being stuck up kind of thing there's this 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 is a kind of like theme in culture and I, I think it's really interesting that he that instead of casting a kind of classically you know tall dark and handsome brooding bad boy type to play the role that they've gone this way because I think it's there's a real insight there yeah I think it is perfect casting actually and you're right we, we've talked about Zola on the podcast before and I think that mm. yeah, they, they would make a really interesting double bill and, and yeah. I think yeah he's he's sort of cornering the market in this kind of role and that that ambiguity really works for him I mean yeah. one, one thing that that comes up um in the film is the question of what constitutes stalking and, what, and mm. what's being creepy and what's just being persistent. And then again, this is a, a trope that we've talked about in cinema. Sometimes mm. there's quite a damaging idea that if a man is persistent enough, he will eventually get the girl. That, that can be persistent, can be harassment. How do you feel about the, the film tackling this subject? I love that it's tackling this subject. Again, it's this kind of thing of women talking to women. And I love that it's allowing it to be quite a complicated gray area that there is some back and forth that there is some like you know young women are not little girls they have responsibility to take their own actions as well that there's a you know that's not victim blaming or victim blaming does certainly exist but you know the, the, all these things it's kind of knotty issues that it's getting into yeah I, I I really appreciate that there's a there's a sex scene in it that I thought was excellent as well I mean it's a very bad sex scene but <laughs> as in the sex is bad but the scene is wonderful it, it reminded me of the film How to Have Sex Molly Manning Walker's brilliant debut feature which also deals with these kind of grey areas of consent and in in you know the modern world of heterosexual dating um I just like that it's acknowledging the fact that it's not always a clear line that sometimes young women are kind of projecting a sort of sensitivity or vulnerability onto men that they're not worthy of um, to make themselves feel safer. So, you know, all these, all these sort of double bluffs that we get ourselves or tangles that, that people can get into. And yeah, I, I think it is, it's really good that it explores that stuff. Listen to me. Call it a night. Hey, do we want to do this? This is the worst life decision I've ever made. I had a good time tonight. Didn't you? Yeah. So what was his go-to move? The reverse squatting cowgirl? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting scene, really important scene. As you say, we're going to be featuring how to have sex on the podcast in the future because it hasn't mm. come out here yet in the UK. And it, I think, again, that's a great comparison because it's so important that cinema explores consent in an honest way. And, and, and let's face it, in, in the format of an entertaining film mm. so that people do, a wide range of people watch it and discuss it and are perhaps a little challenged by it. I haven't spoken to many men who've seen this film. You know, it's, it'd be very interesting. I think that's really, that is really interesting. I think, and also by extension, I wonder how it's going to be received because there was, like, as I say, when the short story came out, there was this big furore over it. And part of it was kind of along gender lines in that, I, this is my analysis of the situation, but I think men aren't used to seeing themselves characterized through from a woman's point of view in the way that women are used to the to the reverse and it is uncomfortable it doesn't always feel good it's not flattering it's not the way you might want to see yourself and I wonder if when this film comes to be reviewed given that the critical you know establishment is still mainly older white men that there might be some kind of you know butt hurt I guess <laughs> maybe not, not to put too by the point in it about how it will affect the way it will be because 
you know, we pretend as we like to pretend as critics that we're always perfectly neutral, that we can sit in front of any film and give it a fair hearing. But I think the reality is that we all do have kind of personal baggage from or just, you know, a life experience that we bring to films. And if you haven't been a young woman in many of these situations, it might be hard to see the film from that point of view. Yeah, I mean, it will touch a nerve, won't it, Mm. with a lot of men watching. And and as you say, we're sadly accustomed to seeing ourselves Mm. being, you know, not just objectified, but looked at in a critical way, I would say, Mm. much more. I think this film should be seen by women and men and then having great discussions like the one we're having now, although those can then be spoilerific. Um, (laughs) Who would you recommend the film to? Oh, as as you say, like everybody. But as I say, it's talking to to young women, it's talking to older women, it's older women talking to young women and vice versa. But also I I think there is this quite bracing criticism of sort of male fragility in it that that men could really benefit from seeing (laughs) lots of, of young, even if it is uncomfortable. Um, and it's it, it, and it is really funny. It's re- it's really well acted. You know, the director Susanna Fogel co-wrote Book Smart, which is another incredible film about young women that everyone should see. So I, I think, and I I love um, Geraldine Viswanathan as well. She she plays the best friend Taylor in, in it, who um, is coming at things from a different point of view to Margot, which which I have to say represents my own. I think she's right about everything she says. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I can see so. that you would relate to her, but I, but I also sort of feel that yeah, she's she's a great sort of counterpoint character I mean basically mm. she, she's she's a, a strong feminist and yeah. she she gives Margot some great advice and sometimes they have some conflicts I like that it's not resolvable because women are yeah. in this weird situation young women yeah young heterosexual women are in this weird situation which Margaret Atwood perfectly categorized in her famous quote but where we're basically going on dates forced to get into romantic entanglements with our apex predator where it's like both incredibly neurotic to be, think that is this date gonna? Is this the? Is this first date the first scene in a rom com, or is it the first scene in a serial killer horror movie? You know, that's both a very neurotic thought to have, and also not entirely unrealistic, given you know what's going on with the endemic of violence against women across the world. So but I love that it's it's like just grappling with that feeling that a lot of women understand of sort of veering from one to the other, of thinking I'm being ridiculous to no, I need to think care of my personal safety, that and, and and not think and not coming down exactly on one side or the other. Absolutely, and I think. Yeah, it feels like actually an important film in many ways um, Mm. with that in mind. And and the fact that we still need to explore this topic, the fact that the article provokes so much conversation, this film, I hope, will, shows Mm. how much we still need to continue exploring this topic and how little it is explored um, effectively in cinema. So, Mm. yeah, it feels like an important moment. But I do uh, want to celebrate that there are this rash of films coming out now. And this is one of the women are making these incredible films about women's experiences. Exactly. And we're absolutely thrilled to be speaking to Susanna Fogel on this very episode. She's amazing. (gasps) Second time we've had her on Girls on Film and she's like, I am a huge fan of her. And it's great to see her getting the work that she deserves. Because I've always sort of thought Mm. she's such a great director and Mm. perhaps we don't see enough of her work on the big screen. Ellen, is there anything you want to share with listeners in terms of where they can hear you, where they can read your work? Yes. So I'm uh, the co-host of Screenshot on BBC Radio 4. That's also a podcast. I co-host that with with the wonderful Mark Kermode. Um, I'd love if people gave that a listen. I'm a writer for The Guardian and Empire magazine as well, primarily at the moment. Um, and I've got my first proper book coming out in February. It's called Screen Deep, How Film and TV Can Solve Racism and Save the World. So if that intrigues you, uh, give that a pre-order. It's coming out in favour in February. I didn't know that. Congratulations. I Thank am intrigued. You. And maybe you can come <laughs> on and talk about it when it comes out. Oh, I'd out. love to. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thanks so much, Ellen. Great to speak to you. That was critic Ellen E. Jones. Cat Person is in UK and Ireland cinemas from Friday the 27th of October 2023. You can hear my interviews with Amelia Jones in Girls on Film episodes 90 and 108 and my first interview with Susanna Fogel on episode 154. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, producer Lydia Scott, audio editor Emma Butt, intern Charlotte Matheson and our partners for this episode, Studio Canal. I'm Anna Smith, and thank you for listening to Girls on Film. Be back soon.
Kelvin, you need to shut that shit down right now.